Well, good afternoon. Uh, of course, I also would like to start by thanking the Academy very much. It was witnessed this process over the last 15 years uh, come together, and, and I think we have a lot to be proud about of, of uh, on the International Academy. Um, and my would like to share my uh, uh, prayers and uh, and love for uh, Klaus, and I wish him absolutely the, the best. So this is our last panel, Peace and Justice, Current Challenges. We're going to uh, cover it with three or four eight-minute presentations. Uh, talking with Serge at lunch, uh, he was lamenting how difficult it is to have to discuss so much in a few minutes. Uh, I am uh, reminded of my favorite German and world citizen, Einstein. A journalist once asked him if he could explain relativity in one sentence. And he said, uh, yes, but it would take me two years to prepare it. And <laughs> uh, um, our CVs are summarized in the excellent program. Uh, but I want to describe um, my work a little to be able to make a few brief points uh, as moderator. They're somewhat eccentric, perhaps, but in relation to our conference's main narrative, but I think worth expressing. My organization, WFM, is an old peace movement, uh, a rarity, a, a root cause rule of law uh, peace movement. At our offices in New York and uh, and The Hague, we have a number of different projects. Uh, of course, the largest is the Coalition for the International Criminal Court, uh, which is over 2,500 NGOs in 150 countries working for the Rome Statute. But we also have a uh, host, the NGO Working Group on the Security Council, the Center for UN Reform, uh, the International Coalition for the Responsibility to Protect the UN Office for the Global Partnership for the Prevention of Armed Conflict and the Prevention Upfront Project of the, that organization and ours. A number of women peace and security projects. Last year we uh, co-hosted a campaign called One for Seven Billion, which over a three-year period changed the procedures on how the Secretary General is appointed. And it, would, it is a lasting, we think, improvement to defend in the UN system. Um, our strategies uh, are really because of our, our membership is very limited and it's a, we're a membership organization, but, uh, but we have very serious financial uh, uh, human and expertise limitations. So what we have been doing most of the last 20 some years is, is to work with north-south cross-sectoral networks of non-governmental organizations um, with uh, north-south coalitions of governments and sometimes international organizations on specific democratic global governance strategies. And most of these are, are strategies or projects that relate to major structural failures or deficiencies in the international legal order. Um, you won't be surprised, I, I still believe and have, will believe that the Rome Statute and the evolving Rome Statute system is one of the greatest achievements in international law in history. In the league with the anti-slavery movement and the UN Charter. It was an achievement of a hundred small and middle power democracies uh, from Asia, from Africa, South America, Europe, and North America. And it was a, that coalition of governments was a, had a, a crucial partnership with uh, about 500 members of the coalition for the International Criminal Court. And it's, it's that coalition that is, I think, uh, uh, the reason that the statute was agreed to uh, in Rome in 1998. And we had, I think, crucial support from then Secretary General Anon. That was um, on the few points I wanted to make of, about bubbles, structure, language, and tipping points. Um, every couple of years, at the end of the 
holidays, uh, we'll have a brown bag lunch, and I'll uh, at some point ask my staff and the interns, when you go home for the holidays, what do you say to your brothers and your sisters and your parents and your best friends what you do? And they almost all ugh, groan because it is so difficult to explain what they do. I have uh, eight brothers and sisters, doctors, lawyers, deans of graduates, uh, school. In 20 some years, they have no idea what Billy does. <laughs> it's to, 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 to this, and so it's, it's a, I think it's an important to, to know that we do um, exist in these bubbles, and it's a serious issue. Uh, at lunch, a world expert was commenting on the enormous support for the ICC that existed 15 years ago has disappeared. I don't really think so. I think we've always been in a fairly limited bubble. <laughs> And uh, my next door neighbors, even the, people, the office next door in my building set, have never understood what international justice and international criminal court, et cetera, is. So there's some very worrisome things I'm going to mention about that, but there's some very positive things. The main positive thing is that it is a small bubble, and communities like this, as I think Richard Dicker was pointing out, can have a major impact on on that, the community for inter international justice. Um, our bubble language is unique. I mostly exist in the international justice bubble that's linked to the International Criminal Court and to the UN. Um, most of our language is not communicable <laughs> to the outside. Um, it's, so there's this impenetrable uh, diversity to the bubbles. <laughs> and, I th and, and within these large bubbles um, are, are sub-bubbles and silos. And silos is the, new, is the new language. NGOs, governments, government representatives, international organizations, international organization representatives, media, donors, and very often we rarely are able to speak with each other even though we're in the same bubble. <laughs> so there's been great criticism in recent years of the silos, but acknowledging and criticizing the silos is not the same as overcoming their existence or the severe impacts uh, of the silos, including, as I was mentioning this morning, the walls between uh, development and humanitarian sectors, between those sectors and human rights and, uh, and rule of law. But it is, as I said, we can, uh, I think, have a huge influence, even a few people, but certainly a few hundred people on this entire project, and that has been the experience that we've seen since 1995. The second point on, on, or point I want to make on structure, that if you don't confront the structural deficiencies in the international legal order, like the failure of the Security Council and the veto, you are literally rearranging and reupholstering the chairs on the, on the Titanic. And so at some point you need to deal with those structural issues, and that's what some of us in certain parts of the bubble are trying to do. It doesn't mean that we don't see how important and valuable a lot of the other's work is. Um, third point I want to make is about prevention uh, and catastrophic crisis reaction. 99%, I, the, the Security Council is incapable of prevention in, our, in my mind, with one possible exception, but, and, but it is, it, the UN mainly is able only to do catastrophic crisis uh, reaction. So something has to be in a really terrible situation before the international community through that mechanism is willing to deal with it. And 
Why I make this point is that the new Secretary General, I think, has properly made prevention the centerpiece of the administration, and how it's going to be done is one of the, I think, existential questions for the human race uh, for the, the coming, coming future. But we should stop or be, at least be careful that we're, when most of the time when people are talking prevention, they're talking about certain elements of catastrophic crisis reaction. They're not talking about real prevention. Last point on, on or next point is on language. That um, um, we know that it's titled two dimensional failure. We know that our world and our bubbles and our silos are very multi dimensional, but we are mostly prisoners of two dimensional language and thinking. And so inside, outside, headquarters versus field, top down, bottom up, local, global, peace, justice. Um, the two-dimensional frameworks also seriously, I think, impair our ability to uh, achieve progress. Uh, the last and the hopeful point is where I, I was also kind of at the beginning, is the idea of a tipping point, that um, if we can get 100 to 120 small and middle power uh, governments and democracies to stand up against the big powers, against the P5, the dictatorships, and the structural deficiencies, I think we can, in this next 20 years, achieve true structural prevention in the international legal order. And, uh, and I think the, the International Criminal Court and the Rome Statute system is a very important uh, pillar in that uh, future uh, system and structure. So from for this uh, more overarching conceptual and structural consideration, we are now going to focus on specific cases, Colombia, South Sudan, and the uh, Central African Republic. And first, Dr. Nelson Camilo Sanchez Leon is a Colombian lawyer and legal scholar, and we turn it over to you. And on that ambitious note, uh, let's start with Colombia. Um, as previous uh, presenters, I feel honored and excited to be here too, and for that I thank uh, the organizers. But I have to confess that every time I heard um, thanks to the Academy, I thought I was in the Oscars. But <laughs> now thinking about it, um, they always, um, they always, you know, set aside the, the, the best for last. So I think that now it's best actor and best director. I thank the Academy for <laughs> good. You laugh, so you're alive <laughs> and awake. So what I want to do in my 10 minutes is um, first um, talk about the generalities of the general characteristics of, of the agreement. Camila already done uh, so much for me, so that's going to be very brief. And then what I'm going to try to do is to highlight three challenges using uh, the language of the declaration. And um, I want to, to do that in order to, to show some of, of the problems or the challenges that we have. I know that for many people we are the poster boy of justice in the world, but as Camila already mentioned, we've got a lot, a lot to do. You know, we've overcome uh, a lot of problems, but still we are in the early beginning of, of trying to come up with a solution for, uh, for a wide range of problems. So first, you heard it's a very comprehensive agreement, and you know, it, it goes beyond the, you know, a very classic approach of transitional justice, just you know, using the, the toolkit of transitional justice, but it goes further and we call it that it's a, it has at least three different parts. One is what people call in my country the territorial peace, which is try to think and to build peace in the territories, in the regions, because um, it is not so much needed in Bogota or in the um, major urban areas, but in the, con in the countryside. Second, what we call social peace. There are uh, measures that are aimed at um, 
confronting historical inequalities, for example, in terms of land and political participation. And um, there is this belief that if we tackle that, then we can have a better chance to, to be a less sustainable peace. And then the agreement on victims which is that the one that contains mostly all of the provisions for uh, transitional justice and justice at large. Um, and for that, uh, the, the, the peace agreement creates three different mechanisms. Uh, special jurisdiction for peace, um, TC, TCC, instead of, of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, we, um, Thinking of what you mentioned yesterday on, on the panel of reconciliation, we, we thought that reconciliation was just too much of, of, a, of a big issue. So it's truth, coexistence, and, and non-recurrence commission, which is something like the same, but we were very afraid of the term reconciliation. And um, there is that, which I think it's a, a workable model. It's a very complicated model. Uh, but still, it's uh, printed and, and it's agreed upon, and you know what happened later on with the plebiscite. But then, let me say a very, just some of the current challenges, and I'm gonna start with principle two. In the second paragraph, it states that as a minimal application of this principle, amnesties must not be granted to those bearing the greatest responsibility for genocide, crimes against humanity, and serious violations of international humanitarian law. So you can say that there is the basis for what we call now the principle of selection or selectivity, right? And the first challenge I think that we faced was that if that is a principle for international justice, or a principle that applies to for domestic justice, you know, because as the, the, the idea is that international justice is comple complementarity and it complements the, the, the domestic system, there is this belief then that the international criminal court can select some cases, but domestically you have to deal with every case and each case. So can that principle be applied in a domestic setting? And we have first, first encounter with um, Mrs. Bensuda that uh, bully our domestic constitutional court. I know that people at the OTP don't like me to say this, but I think it was bully. She sent private letters to the court when the court was revisiting this issue domestically. And they, she said, no, wait. That's a principle but that is applied by my office because we are international, but this is different because you are domestic. So we had a very long debate about that, but in the end, it is stick. The, what, that was the proposal of the government. We are going to do a, a, this idea of selection, but then the challenges, well, that was the first, but then the practical challenges, you know, because um, as a political scientist, told me once, he said like, you know, you lawyers are so funny, so cute and naive. Because with these international provisions, you are sending the government to Havana to tell the FARC, you know, according to international law, we have good news and bad news. Okay, tell us. Good news is that not every one of you has to go to jail. Because now international law, you know, provides for this idea of the greatest responsibility and the, the um, gravest crimes. Excellent. And what's the bad news? The bad news is that you bear the greatest responsibility. Because you negotiate with the elite of the other army, right? So that's kind of difficult to sell. And on the other hand, you know, we, we started to push this idea of, you know, you have to accept this idea of the selection and, and the greater responsibility. Okay, okay. So the guerrilla says and tells the government, we understood. Yeah, we understood. Okay. So you're saying those who bear the greater responsibility. Yes. And for the gravest crimes. Yes. So there is 12 of us, and then we need three presidents, three ministers, and because that's on your side too, right? And we are negotiating. So it shows how difficult it is, it is to bring an, uh, an agreement around this. We finally ended up with some sort of an agreement, but then 
I think that I thought with some colleagues at the beginning that it was going to be, you know, the best possible deal. Because for, for some, this idea of, of selection was already an amnesty. You know, because when you select, you are pe you're, you're letting people off the hook, you know? So for some, it was already a, 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 a problem. We tried to convince international lawyers that this could be doable. And in the end, it was kind of the narrative that it, was, it could be done. But then the guerrilla didn't like it. They wanted the mechanism to go after everyone. And I was like, what? <laughs> We've already done so much work on this, and why? Oh. <laughs> it's the academy. You can't talk about it. OK. <laughs> okay. Then why? I, I think for three good reasons. First, one could say that for a cynical reason, they said, like, if you try to try us, all of us, plus on the other side, and then the third parties, then you're going to have 25,000, so it's going to crash the system. Second, I think the idea that it is different to be one of the 17 that were trial here, it's different to be one of the 20, 25,000, right? In terms of what it shows and the narrative of that. And third, they had a really good point, and that was, look, you are asking us to guarantee that our troops are not going to just to go and become you know, a new guerrilla or, or, or a new group, right? The moment you put us behind bar, that the DDR process goes out the window. Because first, we are materially impossible to you know, command or to have um, some sort of ascendance with, with them. And second, symbolically, when you put us behind bars, they're going to be the new leaders of the group. So for that reason, they decided that all on the same batch. And um, in the end, we ended up with this crea creative ambiguity in which it's not so clear that the selection principle is there, but it's there. And, and, and that was good for the agreement because both parties signed on, but now, Setting up, setting up the, the, the court. And at the beginning of the trials, then we have to deal with this. And how do you make this process of selection a legal process? Because in the past, what I think we have had is political process of selection. You know, politically, they pick some guys and put it here and in some other countries. But here is going to be a legal one using all of these criteria which is more, you know, like more impact or, or, or cruelty or, and how to do that um, judicially is going to be a um, challenge. My second challenge was that, obviously, at, at this point, I cannot address it, victim's participation. And the third, this relationship between retributive and restorative justice. So if you want to know more about that, you should come to Colombia, and I'll be happy to have you there. <laughs> And I'll even pay for the coffee. Thank you very much. Next, uh, we have uh, Ms. Kelly Case, the Deputy Director of Africa Programs uh, for Inclusive Security. Kelly. Wonderful. Uh, I want to first thank the Academy as well. Um, it's been a privilege to be here the last couple of days. Um, I want to preface my discussion with um, the fact that I do not have a legal background. So if somebody asks me about the ICC, I will likely not be able to answer the question. So I'm going to take a little bit of a different perspective um, when talking about South Sudan. So I want to start by just going briefly over the current context. I'm sure most of the people in the room know, but I think to understand the gravity of the situation, it's good to sort of refresh our memory about where things stand on South Sudan. So South Sudan has been in violent conflict for almost four years now. Um, what started off as a conflict between forces loyal to President Salva Kiir, who's of the Dinka tribe, and forces loyal to former Vice President Riyak Mashar, who's with the Nuer tribe, quickly devolved into a, a pretty tribal conflict with uh, horrific brutality. Uh, the, according to the most recent OCHA report, uh, there are 1.88 million internally displaced people, 
2.1 million refugees in neighboring countries, and 6 million, so half the population, are severely food insecure. The UN Special Representative on Sexual Violence estimates that the levels of sexual violence in South Sudan now represent the highest of any conflict environment in the world. Tens of thousands killed, potentially hundreds of thousands, and this is the largest refugee crisis on the continent. So what I'm going to do next is actually show a brief three-minute video that my organization put together that I think will help frame my discussion and allow you to hear from South Sudanese directly. I always feel uh, a bit uncomfortable in these types of circumstances because it's really the South Sudanese who should be speaking about their challenges, not necessarily myself. So I want to show a brief vid video that will help frame my discussion a bit. The gunshots started around 10 p.m. We spent the whole night without power. I've never ever heard that much ammunition my entire life. After decades of war, South Sudan voted to separate from Sudan, and soon after, civil war broke out in the South. Tens of thousands of people have died. Two million people are displaced. Women are devastated, and they are the top loser of any conflict. When we are visiting the community, we have to listen to them. We have to listen to their problems before any solution. Sarah and Pilek are members of a group called the Task Force for the Engagement of Women in Sudan and South Sudan. Sarah and Pilek are very different people. Sarah is the head of South Sudan's largest network of women. She has reached into every one of South Sudan's states. Pilek is younger, energetic. She reaches people throughout the country as well, but through media, through the internet. And remarkably together, they have a very clear common purpose. And that's to ensure that the voices and the priorities of the people are heard by the most powerful. Nobody is interested in what the community thinks, how the women are affected, or how to restore these people's lives. We bring the task force to Ethiopia because it's the home of the African Union and it's also where South Sudan's warring parties meet to hold peace talks and decide the future of their country. The language of the peace agreement is, is very heavy on reconciliation and healing and very light on justice and accountability. And coming from the grassroots, um, working with women at the grassroots, it's, they were, their message is very clear in terms of justice and accountability. So we believe that if we have a good constitution and rule of law, Women know what's going on on the ground. They know what people want, what people are saying, and what their country needs. But what some women aren't exposed to is the very technical language and the very technical process of peace negotiations. So we break that open with them. What we do is ensure that their very powerful voices are heard at the highest and often very exclusive levels of decision making. It's very rare for there to be any connection at all between the highest levels of power and the people. And the task force is that connection. I'm not a fortune teller, but I know that the job that I'm doing now is preparing me for something, and I'm open for whatever it is that's coming my way. Sarah and Pilek are like women we work with around the world. They're courageous, they're smart, and they're creating a more inclusive future for their country. And that's awesome. Thank you. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about why inclusion is important in peace processes and relate it back to South Sudan. So that video was taken um, almost two years ago now, so the statistics are a bit off. Um, and what I'm going to talk, I'm going to put a couple statistics up on the screen, and it's the statistics are talking about women in the peace negotiations, but it really goes for women throughout the entirety of the peace process, right? So inclusion is not the norm around the world. Um, currently, our global system dictates that those who pick up weapons and perpetrate horrific violence are the ones that get a seat at the table where war is ended and the future is determined. And so what you often have are people talking about um, power and position and territory and not talking about the root causes of war. Um, I think, you know, over the last several years, the narrative around inclusion has definitely increased, and I think people see the importance of it, but the statistics don't quite bear that out yet. So I want to ask a question of how many women do you think have been signatories to peace agreements? 
Does anybody want to wager a guess or no off the top of their head? Anybody? No? Okay. Yeah? Close. Four <laughs> percent. So that means 96 percent of the people who sign peace agreements are men. So when critical decisions are being made about governance, justice, security, half of the population is left out. So what's the result of that? Half of all peace agreements fail within five years. And we're seeing that in South Sudan right now. And we know inclusion makes a huge difference. I think everyone in this room will agree with me that we believe that women have an absolute right to be at the table, but it's also a matter of efficacy. So decades of research show that when women are meaningfully included in negotiations, the agreement is 35% more likely to endure for at least 15 years. And you'll see that I highlighted the word meaningful because that's really important, right? It's not just about the quantity of women at the table, it's the quality of their participation. So now on to the challenges in South Sudan. So this could take two days of a conference. So I'm just going to highlight a few of them. Not surprisingly, I would argue the lack of meaningful inclusion of women in communities throughout the peace process is, is a big challenge in South Sudan. There was a peace agreement signed in 2015, um, August of 2015, and on paper that process looked quite inclusive, but it was uh, deeply flawed for a lot of reasons that I don't really have time to go into now. Um, but the women in South Sudan have been fighting for their inclusion for, for years. Um, right when conflict broke out in 2013, they mobilized, they were in Addis, trying to ensure their voices were present in the talks. Women at the grassroots were bringing Nuer and Dinka together over tea to try and bridge divides. And as the video mentions, um, women have usually have a better sense of what's happening at the community level, and they can engage the community so they don't feel so alienated from the process. Um, and we're also seeing this in implementation of the peace agreement, which has been <laughs> lackluster at best. Um, they're not systematically engaged women or communities. And there's also a new process that's going to be starting soon called this revitalization forum, which we've heard just recently that is going to be completely closed off to civil society and very few women participating. So we're seeing this happen over and over throughout the entire process. Um, so the next challenge is impunity. So we've talked about this um, over the last two days. So just briefly, um, the government and the opposition have really been able to act with complete impunity. So the violence that's been going on really unabated since the peace agreement's been signed, and there has been a ceasefire in place, but um, it's just gone on, it's, it's rampant. And the stories we're hearing particularly of violence against women, uh, gang rape and sexual mutilation, mutilation and sexual slavery is just horrific. And the regional and international community has really not followed through on their threats, and it continues uh, unimpeded. And the agreement calls for three different types of justice mechanisms. So it calls for a hybrid court that the African Union Commission is supposed to stand up. It calls for a truth, uh, reconciliation, and healing commission and a um, uh, reparations and compensation authority. So there's been virtually no movement on all three of these. Uh, thirdly, I would say that historical grievances and trauma is a huge issue in South Sudan. So we're talking about decades and decades of insecurity and the effect that has on one's psyche. And you're also talking about, you know, Nuer and Dinka had a lot of problems even before the current civil war. With the war with the North, there was a lot of things that happened and there was never a redress of those grievances. And so they festered for a long time. You also have a population that's deeply traumatized. Violence is normalized at this point and is... Anybody who knows trauma, it's a cyclical thing, right? If you can't get out of it, you're likely going to be perpetrators of crime. And you're also seeing um, multi-generational transition of trauma. So that generations, trauma is being passed down to generations. And you see that often in the form of violence, but also in dignity-destroying beliefs and structures that are created based on trauma that then traumatize others. And finally, um, economic violence. So... There is prevention of people being able to have a livelihood. There's lack of access to resources. Um, you have no petrol in Juba. You have people who really can't afford basic necessities, basic supplies. You have soldiers that are not getting paid for months on end. You have government workers relatively high up that are maybe getting $30 a month, and that's maybe every few months. You also have judges who went out on a strike for six months because they weren't getting paid. And so this creates even further violence in the field, and you hear stories about generals telling the soldiers you can rape women in lieu of your salary. You hear about women literally dropping their children off at restaurants in Juba, and abandoning them in the hopes that somebody will take care of them because they can't. 
So imagine getting to that point where you're abandoning your child. I mean, you are literally living day to day not knowing. There's no predictability about what's going to be tomorrow. And it really makes it it's such a challenge uh, to achieving peace and justice. So I'll leave it there for now. <laughs> Thank you. And the third presentation on this panel uh, from the Graduate uh, Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva, uh, Patrick Labuda. Patrick. Um, yes. Uh, thank you, Bill, uh, for that kind introduction. And uh, thank you also, of course, to the organizers uh, for the opportunity to be here. Um, it is a great privilege and also a, a, a great pleasure to be able to, to speak to you about um, justice in the Central African Republic and specifically um, I will focus on uh, the Special Criminal Court in, in the Central African Republic. Um, so my optimism about the Special Criminal Court in car ebbs and flows and um, I'm currently very optimistic about it actually. Um, when I started following this process um, back in 2014 when we started discussing the possibility of a hybrid court in CAR, I was uh, very skeptical, I have to say. Um, it, it didn't look very serious. Um, people were talking about um, a potential genocide in the Central African Republic, so it, it just didn't look like a hybrid court was a, a very uh, reasonable thing to do. But um, it's, it's happening, it's happening. And, and um, I want to share with you um, sort of my, my um, opinion about this. And of course, I, I, I can't discuss everything that, that's happened uh, in the last three years, but I do want to begin by saying some things, um, some positive things about the process. Uh, because I do think that we are learning from past experiences. Uh, of course, we are here to discuss uh, what's happened between 2007 and today. And you know, the optimistic message is that I think we are learning from uh, past experiences. And I say this also partly because I used to be involved in a very similar process in the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, um, where I used to be embedded with a uh, with a justice support mission, and we uh, tried to help the authorities in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, we tried to help them um, um, with a very similar initiative, tried to help to establish uh, a hybrid court in, in the DRC, and it fell apart for a variety of reasons, but one of the reasons was also the international community's complete inability to get their act together. Uh, very discouraging, and it, it's not happening in the Central African Republic. So that's that's a very uh, positive um, development, I think. So, how has the international community been able to help? First of all, the drafters of the organic law that establishes the Special Criminal Court uh, drew on the expertise of civil society and uh, international experts who had dealt with hybrid tribunals um, in the past. Uh, then people who are currently involved in the establishment of the Special Criminal Court are again drawing on the, their logistical and technical experience working at other hybrid tribunals. Uh, and, and this has helped them to devise, I think, viable blueprints for the Special Criminal Court, for um, we call it operationalizing the Special Criminal Court. And again, I think this is crucial because w the, the budget, for example, that was proposed is realistic. It's, it's not a budget that kind of assumes that everything's going to go um, to plan. It, it is a realistic bu budget that's being now, um, that's being implemented. Uh, and one last thing, uh, the international community is supporting uh, the Special Criminal Court. They are intervening when it matters. And you know, there are a few examples. The European Union jumped in recently uh, to uh, provide funding to the uh, Central African authorities. They were supposed to refurbish the building that would host the, the Special Criminal Court. It turned out, of course, that the uh, Central African authorities would not be able to do that. So the EU jumped in. 
Uh, I, I'd also like to mention the Wayamo Foundation that uh, organized a workshop recently for the magistrates that were recently appointed also to the Special Criminal Court. And this was an opportunity for the magistrates that had been appointed to kickstart the process of um, not investigating crimes in the Central African Republic, but getting to know each other. They'd been appointed, but nobody had met. Uh, so, that, for example, the international um, magistrates had been appointed, but they are going to join their colleagues in the Central African Republic only next month, some of them. And the workshop was organized in July, and it was an opportunity to get to know each other and, 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 and to start discussing the way forward. So, you know, these kinds of, it's, it's just an example, but these kinds of um, um, interventions that have, have I think, really um, helped to, to um, take the process forward. Uh, before I move to, um, I think, well, we need to also discuss a few challenges, but, but again, I, what I want to emphasize is that we are learning, I think, from past experiences, and this kind of proactive advocacy can be helpful. And I, I say this also, um, I do not say this lightly, because uh, some of you know that I'm, I'm quite critical of the International Criminal Court's uh, intervention, for example, in the Central African Republic where it has done a very poor job, I think it's fair to say. It's done virtually nothing so far, which is, which is very disappointing. Uh, and hopefully it will change. There, there are investigations underway, but I'm, I'm also hopeful that the international community is starting finally to pay more attention to the Central African Republic, and it's, it's an issue that I'll come back to later. Uh, so just uh, a few challenges and the way forward. Um, how much time do I have? Uh, about five minutes. Okay, five minutes, yeah. So a few things about the Special Criminal Court. It was created in um, June 2015. That's when the Transitional uh, National Assembly passed this organic law that established the court. Uh, and it's taken two years to nominate um, uh, magistrates to this court. So the first... Uh, magistrates were finally sworn in in June 2017, so exactly two years after the law was adopted. Uh, again, it took a while. Uh, we can come back to this uh, later, why, did, why it took so long. But, but finally, uh, the special prosecutor, for example, has been sworn in. And again, the work is, uh, has begun. It is a hybrid court which means that it will employ both international and national staff. But from a formal legal perspective, and this matters for a variety of reasons, it is a national court. So it's a Central African court. Um, so a national court that is fully integrated into the Central African legal order. Uh, again, I think it's important to keep these two things in mind. So it's both a hybrid court and a national court, and again, uh, this matters for a variety of reasons, uh, some that uh, we might be able to come back to in, in the Q&A. Uh, the, the Special Criminal Court is supported heavily by uh, MINUSCA, the UN peacekeeping mission in the Central African Republic. Uh, and I think this is, this is really one of the unique things about, about this court. It's the first time that uh, a peacekeeping operation is really driving the establishment of such a hybrid tribunal. And this creates both opportunities and challenges, serious challenges, I, I would argue, especially now that the court is up and running. Because MINUSCA is realistically a party to the conflict in CAR. Increasingly, it looks that way. And it, this is going to be a problem because MINUSCA has, um, uh, it's called uh, UTMs. Um, it has a mandate to implement UTMs, urgent and temporary measures. So the peacekeepers in CAR are allowed to arrest and detain people. Um, so again, arrest and detain people that can then be transferred to the special criminal court. Now, Again, I think you can immediately see that this is risky because once MINUSCA 
gets involved in these kinds of operations, arrests people, transfers them to the Special Criminal Court. The, the, the Special Criminal Court starts trying these people. There's a very close link between the UN and accountability in CAR. And it, it creates challenges, especially because the MINUSCA's first um, sort of task is, is not providing justice, it's, it's keeping the peace, trying to be neutral and, and impartial, which is extremely difficult when you're involved in these kinds of uh, operations. So we'll see, we'll see. This is, this is the first time that a peacekeeping operation is doing something like this. Uh, so uh, the Special Criminal Court also has a, a very broad mandate, which I think is interesting. It, it encompasses not just international crimes, but also serious violations of human rights. So what does that mean, serious violations of human rights? Uh, it's, it's extremely broad. Uh, we don't really know. The prosecutor uh, and his team in Bangui are already are starting to think about this because, of course, potentially that, that, that includes everything, every single violation that was, uh, that's been committed in, in CAR in the last uh, 15 years. So it's a huge challenge. They're probably going to come up with a pr prosecutorial strategy that pri prioritizes certain categories of crimes. Uh, and it's a, it's a big challenge because this is the French system, so uh, les parties civiles, uh, private parties, can submit complaints directly to the special prosecutor. And obviously, everybody will want to submit this kind of complaint. And because it covers everything, literally every single crime falls within the Special Criminal Court's mandate. So as you can see, it's a huge logistical and prosecutorial challenge uh, going forward. Uh, just maybe, maybe very briefly about the temporal mandate. Um, it has an open-ended mandate going back to 2003, but open-ended. This again is very interesting. It's a little bit like the International Criminal Court. It means that uh, the SCC, Special Criminal Court, is involved um, well, we'll be dealing with ongoing crimes. So, um, it, again, uh, we don't really know what that means for the court's impartiality and its ability to function in, in an environment like uh, the Central African Republic where 60% of the territory is controlled by, by armed groups. And um, just one last thing, uh, it'll be established in three stages. So phase one has been completed now. The, uh, the um, special prosecutor, investigative judges, and um, 20 police, judicial police officers have been appointed. Investigations are expected to start uh, later this year. And then the first trial, uh, first trials um, will probably begin some um, at some point in uh, late 2018, which is also when the budget runs out. That's when the, the money runs out for the Special Criminal Court. And, and again, this is, this is gonna be a big problem. Uh, they have a five-year budget, but they've only been able to secure funding for the first 14 months, which is, again, uh, late 2018, which is when the first trial is supposed to start. So it's something we need to already, we need to start thinking about, the international community, I mean, needs to start thinking about because uh, for right, right now, uh, it, it's great. We, there, there's there's uh, money to start investigations, but no money for, for trials. There are a few other challenges, uh, especially the relationship between uh, the ICC and the Special Criminal Court. But um, I think the bottom line, really, at this point, is that a lot has been accomplished. Um, this, this court has been created in a very inauspicious environment. I, I haven't talked really about the, the political situation, um, the violence in CAR. We can come back to this in, in um, the Q&A. Um, but yeah, uh, I think it's really important to acknowledge that a, a lot has been accomplished, uh, especially because the Central African Republic is, is just not a priority for the international community. You only hear about it when uh, a UN official goes to Bangui and once again warns that there is a risk of genocide. Uh, and we keep hearing this all the time. Uh, but the international community only pays attention when you know, we throw out the G word. So yeah, um, I'll stop there. Again, I think uh, 
it's too early to start congratulating um, ourselves, but um, progress has been made. And, uh, but at the same time, uh, the struggle for justice continues. Thank you very much. Um, well, I'll do a few quick questions here, and then we'll go to the um, participants. Uh, on Colombia, uh, I remember, because I was in Cartagena uh, in the last few months of the president of Colombia that ratified the Rome Statute, and I was there for actually a sustainable development conference, but he pulled me out of line to say, Mr. Pace, we're going to proceed, because he knew he only had a few more months to go, that we're not going to be able to prosecute the past. We're, we're, we're ratifying the treaty in order to draw, draw a line in the sand about not the future. So did he make a mistake in ratifying the statute based upon how unhelpful you think the statute has been for the peace process? Um, no. No. Nope for many reasons. Uh, first, I think it was a good idea, the ratification of the Rome Statute, not only because for ethical reasons, I, I shared the, the beliefs and, and what is in there, but, but I think first, a pragmatic issue was that the war continued. You know, and after 2002, we, we Colombia, when, when it ratified, it, it um, subscribed this Article 120 something which says that you postpone for seven years the entry into force of the um, war crimes. So we have 2002 and 2007. But actually, crimes happen both, you know, crimes against humanity and, and war crimes after 2002 and 2007. So there are a lot to cover there. And that's why um, there is um, a current, um, how do you call it, investigation? No, it is not investigation situation. Colombia is a situation country. Um, Preliminary examination. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> and um, so for, for that, I think it's important. But, but also because of the, of the idea of the court in Colombia has been instrumental and, and key in order to reach this agreement. Without the court, the, the, the Inter-American court, and the ICC behind the, behind the scenes, I would say that it would have been very, very difficult to achieve what we achieved. That is that the parties decided to create a special jurisdiction to be tried under that jurisdiction. They were not forced, they agree on that. And they agree on that because I think they knew that international justice was out there. So I think it was a good idea to do it. And uh, Kelly, in terms of South Sudan, uh, is there any uh, inclusive participation in the ongoing efforts to find a, or to either implement the 2015 agreement or to modify and improve that agreement? Um, not a lot. There are some women included in the implementation modalities, but not a lot. I will say what is happening on the ground is you have civil society organizations and women uh, doing their best informally to participate in the process. So going out to communities and trying to develop that feedback loop, right? Because this process, nobody knows about this process here. They just know what there's happening in their everyday life and trying to popularize the agreement so people understand what is in the agreement and what, how it could help them. Um, you have, I think I mentioned, there is this new revitalization forum that EGAD uh, is supposed to be hosting come December. And uh, women have already put forward recommendations on structure, agenda, who should participate. But we've just heard recently, and Betty is more of our expert than I am for sure, um, that it's going to be completely closed off to civil society and likely very limited participation of women. There's also another process of the national dialogue. There's now a national dialogue that the government has launched. Um, I would argue it's a farce to 
stop the moving forward of the revitalization form and the peace agreement. Um, but you do have some pretty strong women in that process, and you have some people that um, I think are cognizant of the purpose behind it, but trying to influence to the best of their ability, and they've been doing some consultations and stuff. But um, again, going back sort of the, the meaningful inclusion of civil society and women is, is not present that much. And, and uh, uh, Patrick, it sounds like I, maybe I misinterpreted, but that the uh, special tribunal is having a very beneficial impact. Uh, but is that not a reason for the ICC to be low profiling its work, or uh, and and to have the ICC there in case the funding issues become? I, I presume the the costs of the hybrid court are not as significant as uh, ICC. <laughs> Obviously, uh, but I'm just was wondering uh, your criticisms of that the court isn't doing anything. But what would it, be, what could it be doing that would be assisting, uh, as opposed to allowing this hybrid process to move forward successfully? Thank you. Uh, yeah, let me maybe clarify what I what I meant by. Uh, when I, when I said that the ICC isn't doing anything, the ICC has been involved in uh, CAR since 2006. Uh, so I, I wasn't actually referring to the current situation because I think the ICC is involved right now in, um, in CAR. We don't know what's going on. Arrest warrants have not been issued, but investigations are uh, apparently underway. Uh, my criticism was um, directed at the ICC before, I would say, 2014. So the ICC opened a situation, an investigation in, in CAR in 2006, and after, after that, it did very little. It brought a, um, uh, a case against uh, Bemba, but this is actually a Congolese case. It has very little to do with the Central African Republic. Uh, crimes were committed on CAR territory, but Bemba is a, is, a, is a Congolese politician, and in a way, this why he was targeted, that's, that's, a, that's a different issue, but, but this was a, essentially a Congolese case. So there have been no CAR cases, actually, at the ICC. Um, so in that sense, it, it has been disappointing for Central Africans. Now, I think the situation might be changing, uh, and, and we don't really know how the Special Criminal Court is going to coordinate its work with the ICC. Uh, apparently, there will be some kind of agreement, uh, but, but that is currently under discussion. It's a little bit too early to tell, and some of this, I think, is, is probably also not in the public domain, um, so we'll see. So let's uh, turn it over in case there's some questions uh, from our participants. And, yes. And please again identify you. Well, I was, oh, that's fine. Go ahead, Mike. Hi, Michael Hartman, uh, UNAMA, and now UN Consult. Uh, I'm an old guy, so let me just, to put the record, uh, my understanding is from being there, uh, on MIB, that was Bosnia, the UN police did make arrests. Uh, both Kosovo and two months later, East Timor were executive mandate missions. They were not hybrid courts, they were all international. But you may want to look at them for some lessons learned. Uh, when you're talking about hybrids, one is a little known as Ramsey. That's the regional assistance mission, Solomon Islands, run by the Australian with a few Kiwis sprinkled in. And uh, that was a hybrid deal, as and the ECCC also is something you might want to look at because the they had a separate UN mission there, which still exists, which supports that court. What I wanted to ask, perhaps you can clarify. You said first all crimes are included. I take it that means all war crimes, crimes against humanity. There's no level. Uh, in terms of the most serious ones, is it all crimes? Number two, uh, when you said it's integrated in the CAR judicial system, is the highest level the special courts appeal 
or does it go up to the Supreme Court or perhaps a court of cassation, since it's the French system, uh, there? And similarly, is the prosecutor the highest level of appeal, uh, sorry, highest level of decision maker, or is there a republic prosecutor that then can give instructions, given prosecutorial hierarchy, to the special court? And the, the, the last issue related to that is, uh, what do you do in a hybrid court in yours when there's a tie? When you have two investigating judges, one is national, one is international, they disagree. That is one of the, one of the reasons why the ECCC was in such great trouble. In the same way, what do you do when you have two prosecutors and they disagree whether to file charges if you have two, one national and one international? Thank you. Thank you. Again, Sarah Kasande, ICTJ. Uh, thank you to the panelists. Uh, I have a question for Patrick uh, regarding the Central African uh, Hybrid uh, Tribunal. I'd like to find out, um, if you're aware, the nature and level of uh, involvement of uh, the people of Central African Republic in the establishment of this mechanism. And uh, obviously in view of the ongoing violence and the other political challenges, what's their perception of the likely impact of this court in addressing some of these ongoing uh, conflicts and uh, causes of these ongoing um, acts of violence, if, if you have an idea about that. And then uh, to Kelly, um, uh, speaking of inclusion, you mentioned that uh, a significant population of South Sudan has been displaced. A large number of them are re uh, refugees in neighboring countries. What can be done to involve them in ongoing uh, revitalization of a peace process so that you have uh, a more inclusive process that uh, addresses also issues of displacement and uh, the issues affecting those who have been um, forced to flee? Alina Bayliss, University of Pittsburgh. Uh, I have two questions that I'd like to invite any of the panelists to answer. Um, this panel made me think back to a couple of our earlier panels and the issues raised there. First, uh, yesterday in the reconciliation panel that I moderated, one of the issues raised was peace agreements and the wisdom of tying transitional justice mechanisms to peace agreements or requiring them in peace agreements. So I'd be interested to hear your comments on what effect you think that has had in your situations. And second, the panel on development, first thing this morning, in which we had a uh, robust discussion about the role of development organizations, uh, the kinds of projects they can fund, how they can best be involved. And so I'd also be interested in hearing about um, the role you think uh, international development has played in these settings and the role it could most productively play. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Mark Kirsten, YAMO Foundation. Quick question for each of you, really. Uh, Patrick, um, you are critical of the ICC for not doing uh, much or anything in the Central African Republic. Uh, being a devil's advocate, so they're, they're creating this hybrid tribunal. In principle, um, it's better, it's a better avenue to achieve justice and accountability because it's closer to the victims and survivors. Uh, it's hybrid, developed capacity, etc. Isn't it, playing devil's advocate, isn't it smart for the ICC to be patient to see if they can do it before they take some of those uh, cases? So isn't, shouldn't you be a little bit kinder, I suppose, to the ICC's record there? Uh, Camille, um, could you explain a little bit more? I wasn't entirely sure why Fatou Bensouda's letters were bullying rather than you know, just normal conversation, being like, these are ex expectations, these are how we feel. Why is it bullying to you? I found that very interesting. And finally, uh, to Kelly, um, if you were to tackle, if they're going to tackle impunity, who is the most responsible in South Sudan? It seems pretty clear, and it seems that because it's so clear that there might be two individuals in particular, that that's exactly why there won't be justice and accountability. However, is there a possibility that Riek Machar, now under house arrest or whatever the South Africans are calling it, in, uh, in South Africa, 
could he be the person who kind of is put on the mantle and is the person that is actually prosecuted at the highest level? And what would that mean, in your view, for reconciliation and peace in South Sudan? Thank you. Yep, thanks. Uh, David Tolbert, ICTJ. Uh, I just had a couple of questions. Um, one relates a little bit to, is sort of connected to what uh, Sarah asked, not just in, in terms of uh, consultations with uh, victims and others, but was there any assessment done in either one of these two cases as to the, the conditions of success? Um, because one of the things that uh, you know, I've been involved in three or four hybrid courts and some of them were basically political projects um, as a response to um, terrible crimes. Others used uh, an assessment process where uh, examination of what the conditions were, the possibilities of investigation, witness protection, and things like that. And I wonder, uh, and maybe you addressed it, but I didn't hear it. Was there any assessment uh, made uh, prior to the decision to set up uh, either one of these uh, um, courts, tribunals? Uh, if so, what were the findings? And I think connected back to, to Sarah's point, uh, what kind of consultations were made? Uh, secondly, um, the, the general reasons that uh, hybrid tribunals are set up are obviously uh, independence or ensuring that there will be fair trials uh, investigated to a certain standard. And uh, the second is a notion that I think, to me at least, is uh, more questionable, and that's capacity building of national staff and national judges um, and national prosecutors. Uh, in my experience, that second uh, basis for a hybrid court is not usually one that works very well. Uh, judges are perhaps the worst trainers you could ever imagine, um, having worked with a few. Um, prosecutors are maybe even worse than that. Uh, so that, that part of the uh, equation, I think, is overrated. Um, and fre you know, frequently there have been language issues. I don't think you'd have that in, th in these cases, since English and French are the, the working languages. But uh, I was curious to know the rationale uh, for establishing a, high, a hybrid tribunal and whether or not uh, those two issues were analyzed. Uh, thirdly, witness protection is uh, obviously a very important issue uh, for these courts, and I wondered if that was assessed and if that has been, uh, has, uh, has been addressed. So um, just some very uh, practical issues. And the other issue that, that keeps coming up in hybrid tribunals is that, that artificial timelines are frequently established for the completion of the work, and then they have to be extended and extended, and staff uh, fall off. Uh, so I wonder if that's part of the equation. I, I didn't hear that. I will say, with respect to Carr, I think you've got an excellent uh, prosecutor in Mutanzini. We worked extensively with him and DRC. I think that's a, you know that's a great boon uh, to that court. Of course, you can't uh, simply rely on an individual, but uh, you know, we had a meeting with him, and he's got a lot of challenges too. So uh, I don't, I don't do. It'd be interesting to just hear a little bit about how the international personnel are selected. You know, sometimes you see us as secondments, which frequently don't work out very well because you're not making the selection; they're just selected by someone else, and frequently it's someone who's a squeaky wheel, or they, they don't. Uh, they don't fit in. So those three or four uh, real practical and uh, uh, technical questions I'd be interested in hearing about. Thank you very much. So let's uh, start, I guess. Um, sure. yep. um, OK. So in terms of engaging women in refugee, refugees and IDPs, um, I wish I had a super creative response for you. But I think um, what we see in is is women who have access to information 
going to the ground to provide people with that information, right? Information as power. And so what a lot of the women that we work with do is they provide that information and then they take the needs and priorities of the people and they put them into recommendations, very technical recommendations around what a peace process looks like, right? Whether it's the revitalization forum, whether it's the national dialogue, and really trying to act, have access to those women and communities to really, really understand what's happening at the grassroots level. Um, so it's, you know, uh, that can be hard. I mean, in South Sudan, it's, you know, a, a lot of the women can get to Uganda. Some of them have gone to some of those refugee camps, but a lot of the IDP camps, it's really dangerous to go to. And a lot of women are fearful of speaking out, right? If you talk about the hybrid court at all in South Sudan, it's, you know, security is probably going to be on you pretty quickly. So it's a really tricky environment because of the insecurity. Um, but that would be my initial reaction. Um, in terms of the reconciliation and development, also a question. Um, it's a really, I really enjoyed the panel discussion yesterday on reconciliation. I, I will say, from my perspective in South Sudan, the peace agreement was rammed down the throats of the two principles, right? They never really truly had the political will to actually implement the agreement. And so now you have a situation where the government is actively trying to postpone any implementation of it, which includes reconciliation. Um, so I think having that included in the peace agreement um, when the peace agreement really, really was not agreed to at all um, is makes it more challenging for that process to move forward. Um, and I also think, you know, reconciliation, it's sort of like in our international toolkit, right? That's just like one of our buzzwords that we talk about and that we should do. And, and I think what you also see in South Sudan is that... Um, they can't sort of step outside of that, right? So when you talk to women and push, like, well, what does that really look like? And what is really going to happen to the peace agreement? And should the peace agreement move forward? Like, maybe there's pieces of it that's really good, but maybe there's not. So what does that look like? And it's because it's framed in a peace agreement and it's signed, sealed, delivered, even though it's not moving forward on implementation, it's, I think it's hard to step outside of that box, right? And to, like, really think about maybe an alternative political process. On the development side, so one of the challenges I actually wanted to mention but knew I didn't have time was international development in South Sudan. So um, just very frankly, I think the international development community in South Sudan has, has done quite a bit of damage, to be honest. Um, there's a lot of good things that have come out of it, and there's a lot of really, really wonderful people doing wonderful things, but we are tripping over each other's feet. And it is inundated with international development. And um, I think... Unfortunately, it's, it's had a negative impact in many ways. I think there's a lot of dependencies in South Sudan. You hear, even from us, you know, we've, I've, we've been working in South Sudan for, for years and years. Um, and, you know, I, you get a sense of that dependency. Well, well the international community is going to, I mean, the international community needs to do this. They need to put pressure on. They need to do this instead of taking a bit more responsibility. And I think that's partly uh, the fault of the international community. Um, I would say about Mashar, um, it's an interesting thought. I hadn't really thought about it, honestly. I, I don't see that happening, and I would say right now, especially in the last year when, conf when violence broke out in Juba last July, the government has really been uh, the main perpetrators of violence. So I'm not sure, just even from a symbolic gesture, if it would make that much difference, um, but it's an interesting, interesting thought. Um, and then the last one, oh, I think that was it for me. Okay, that was to wake you up. Um, just two questions. Uh, first, about um, reconciliation. The, the, language of, of, the language of reconciliation is all over the agreement. Um, it is a 350 pages of, of agreement, very repetitive and very... Uh, difficult to read at, at, at parts, but um, what they, I think, tried to avoid was to put the burden of it in one of the mechanisms. So it's like the overarching goal, but it's not the task, you know, of the Truth Commission, but it has to contribute to that as well as the special jurisdiction and uh, the political participation, the land, um, or the agreement on land and rural reform. So it's like 
The idea is that everything, you know, added together is going to bring about reconciliation and there are some um, measures to, to, like, early measures for, for that. For example, the idea that uh, the guerrillas uh, go on forward and, and um, ask for forgiveness and are, do, they are called early measures of reparations in order to provide a basis for, for that to start. And second, about uh, thank you, Mark, for your question because it allows me to correct myself because of my um, lack of vocabulary in English. Sometimes I do not express my thoughts correctly. I meant to say inappropriate. Uh, that was very inappropriate to my view because uh, we have a, a, a very open process of constitutional review in which everyone can participate. You know, international organizations, for example, can send amicus um, and they have done it. For example, Human Rights Watch, it's a regular in, in all of these issues. And she could have done that. But later on, the court held hearings on this topic and invited a broad range of people to talk and to present the arguments publicly. And the very last week, they were privately discussing the case, and some of the arguments were leaked. Uh, that's when the private layers come. So to me, that was very inappropriate. And, and the language of, of one particular letter was, I think the tone was very difficult for me to understand because um, to me, it was a, a, a there is a, a discussion on interpretation of international law, on current international law, and, and to me, it should have said, it is my interpretation of international law, this, but it was written, international law provides. And I think that was kind of saying, look, I am, you know, this, at this point, you are above me, so I think, and, and, but, but I think, um, it helped everyone in a way that, for example, now that we are reviewing this new agreement that went to the Constitutional Court just yesterday, um, the OTP released an amicus that they submitted publicly before the Constitutional Court. They asked the court and the court publicly invited, uh, invited them to participate and they did it. So there's going to, have to be something to, you know, for the argument and to, for the discussion and for the domestic discussion to be part of that. And I think that's a, a, a more appropriate procedure. Um, thanks. All right, uh, thank you. I, mean, I have 12 questions, so I, I won't be able to do justice to all these questions. I, I propose that we uh, discuss some of these issues uh, over coffee, or is there going to be a coffee break after this? <laughs> no, no. Okay, so maybe just after, after uh, over, beer. <laughs> over beer. Yes, that's fine. Um, so just very briefly, I'll, I'll, I'll try and respond to some of these issues. Michael, uh, first of all, uh, point taken about the UN's involvement. I didn't mean to suggest it's the first time that the UN has been heavily involved in these kinds of issues. Uh, what's unique here is that it really is the peacekeeping mission that is setting up the court. Um, and, and this is very interesting. It, it creates, um, I, I would argue, um, different challenges on the ground for the peacekeeping mission. And I think it will also create different challenges um, for the special criminal court once it's up and running. But um, I'm happy to discuss that later. Uh, I, I do want to discuss this issue uh, because clearly I, I didn't uh, explain this um, clearly uh, I, because uh, my point was that the Special Criminal Court has a mandate to prosecute all serious human rights violations and serious violations of international humanitarian law including genocide war crimes crimes against humanity so the you know the core crimes are including it's it's not even supposed to be focused on that uh, and so yes it covers literally every single crime potentially in the central african republic and uh, the un just published a uh, a mapping report where, for example, they talk about serious violations of economic and social rights. How is the Special Criminal Court going to deal with this? Uh, I, I, I really don't know. There will have to be a prosecutorial strategy. It is, it's an interesting idea. Who put this clause in the law? I don't know. Uh, but it, it definitely creates challenges, and it's something that the Special 
prosecutor, prosecutor will have to uh, deal with. Um, yes, and there's also no uh, clause as to the highest levels of responsibility. It, it can prosecute everyone. Um, the prosecutor, uh, sorry, I, I, I guess we'll discuss this later because I, I can't read my notes here. <laughs> what happens when uh, there's a tie? Uh, this is very interesting. Uh, this is very interesting because uh, I think the UN was very clever. Uh, they gave the Central Africans, so to speak, the numerical majority, so they have more judges, more staff, but when it comes to contentious decisions, it's going to be the international staff who decide. So whenever there's a tie, it gets appealed to, so this is the French system, you have uh, four chambers and uh, the investigative judges, when they take a decision, it can be appe appealed to a special indictment chamber, it's called, uh, and there you have two internationals, one Central African, so they can outvote the Central Africans. Same thing for the trial chamber, if it deadlocks, goes to the appeals chamber where you have two internationals, one Central African. So the Central Africans are, are, were very happy uh, because I, I don't want this to sound condescending, but, but this is how it was portrayed. It's portrayed in the media. We have the numerical majority, but if you actually look very carefully, it's actually the internationals who decide. Um, and again, I, I think the UN knew what it was doing. I don't think this is a coincidence. Um, Sarah, the level of involvement. The, the Central Africans have been involved, yes. Uh, it is a hybrid court. It is a, it is a national court. And the Central Africans, again, emphasize this. Uh, I just mentioned they emphasize the fact that we have more judges. So this is our court. It is a national court. This is our court. At the same time, I think we have to be realistic. Uh, in my personal opinion, it is the UN that's running the show on the ground in Bangui. This is my personal opinion. Maybe it's politically incorrect to say so, but the Central African Republic right now is what the international crisis group called a phantom state. It does not exist. They have no capacity, and realistically, it is a hybrid court, yes, the Central Africans are, are going to be involved, but the UN, for the time being, is, I think, running the show. It's, it's fair, to, fair to say. Uh, expectations, huge. Yes, the Central Africans are hoping that this will put an end to impunity in CAR, and so uh, let's, let's hope that the Special Criminal Court delivers. It, it really is the last hope that's how they see it, uh, the Special Criminal Court, or uh, we don't know what's going to happen. And this brings me to, the, uh, to Mark's question, which is, uh, again, about the ICC. I don't want to be misunderstood here, but the, again, I was talking about the CAR-1 situation in the Central African Republic, uh, and it's hard not to be critical when the ICC did not prosecute a single case. The one case that it prosecuted was a Congolese case again. So the Central Africans have never seen the ICC in their country. So I, I don't even know that we can talk about impact in, in CAR. There, there has been none. But again, they are currently investigating. So there is a second situation that was opened in 2014 and this is what's really interesting. How do we interpret the fact that the special, special Criminal Court was established? What does this mean about the ICC's role in the Central African Republic? I, I wrote an article about this, and I do argue that the reason we have a hybrid court is because the ICC did not deliver. Uh, and, but again, now the question is, what happens next? You have the Special Criminal Court, you have the ICC, and you have the ordinary courts. And, this is an opportunity. This is a, a really big opportunity for the international community to get it right. And the question is, uh, what will happen? Uh, we, st we still don't know. Uh, I, there were a few questions from David. Uh, assessment, uh, so conditions of success assessment. Uh, was there an assessment? done. Uh, my understanding is that the UNDP has been involved and they did do some kind of assessment. How thorough it was, I, I, I don't know. 
what I can tell you, uh, Navi Pillay is not in the room anymore. Uh, my, my, what, I, what, what I heard, at least, is that uh, Navi Pillay suggested the special criminal court, or sorry, not, she suggested uh, uh, a hybrid court to the Central Africans, and they enthusiastically uh, responded that this, this might be um, a viable way forward. And it happened very quickly after that. Uh, Navi Pillay would have to confirm if she was involved, but that, that's the story I heard. But what's really interesting about this is that it happened very quickly. The UN deployed, a memorandum of understanding was, so the UN deployed, the peacekeeping mission was set up in uh, April 2014. The UN deployed in September. In August, they had already signed a memorandum of understanding with the Central Africans. Uh, eight months later, a, a law had been adopted. Two months later, it was promulgated. It happened very quickly. Whether there was an assessment, I, I, I don't, I doubt it. But, 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 yeah, the UNDB has been involved for a long time. Uh, there were quite a few other uh, questions, and I can't read my notes, so I, let, maybe we can just discuss. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Thanks very much. Um, I, I think a couple of things that, that, that as we close is that uh, I think the presence of the new international justice structures um, is having a, a beneficial impact, whether it is inspiring a peace agreement indirectly or whether it is helping make the space so that uh, a phantom state can come back into existence uh, and others. And so, and, and I can just presume that the hybrid isn't costing as much as the peacekeeping <laughs> that is there. So that again, the, uh, while I don't think of peacekeeping as military uh, necessarily, I think the non-military uh, paths towards peace and, and justice is a huge uh, lane in that in that in that path. Uh, again, I think this is time for the final uh, session so would you join me in thanking our very good panel